So welcome everybody. My name is Susan Barber and I'm the Community Education Manager at Mission Hospice and Home Care. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a smallish community-based hospice program located in San Mateo, California. And we serve San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County. And that is basically the area just south of San Francisco down to Silicon Valley. And so we have a very diverse population of people that we serve. We are celebrating our 43rd, 42nd year as a hospice this year. Um, I see Patricia, one of our volunteers, nodding that I got the year right, which is always helpful. And we also um, were founded by two women in our community, which is a really lovely thing to think about. One of them became our first patient and died under the care of Mission Hospice in 1979. Mm -hmm. And her colleague, our co-founder, died in 2014 at the age of 103 years old and had the opportunity to see thousands of families, uh, thousands of people cared for by the hospice that she served. And so, um, I have goosebumps every time I tell that story. I'm particularly feeling goosebumps this today because we're going to um, listen to a talk by Ken Ross. Ken, as most of you know, is the son of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Whoa. has done a remarkable job with the foundation uh, that was set up to honor her work and to continue to, to keep her work alive. I want to welcome those of you from uh, the Elizabeth Kuba Ross Foundations from um, other parts of the world. I know there's several people here from Mexico and other outlying uh, parts of the world, and it's just so grateful that you made the time to be here. Uh, when I first met Ken, I told him a story about um, my first encounter with Elizabeth's work. I was an 11-year-old volunteering at my community library, and uh, my job was to open the boxes and put the numbers on and then file those books in the uh, appropriate places. And one afternoon, I opened up a box that the top book said on death and dying. I have no idea what possessed me because I'm generally an honest person. And I took that book and shoved it into the bag I had brought with me. I took it home and read it under the covers with a flashlight because my parents would have not put up with me reading a book about death or dying or anything, much of anything at 11. And when I went back the next week to volunteer, I brought the book back and put it on the right place on the library shelf. Um, and it was many years, many years, I spent the rest of my life avoiding death like the plague until I had an opportunity to meet Elizabeth in 1998. My life had changed because of the AIDS epidemic. And I know many people of a certain age, at least in the Bay Area, have become uh, working in end of life because of the experience they had uh, with AIDS. And so, um, Elizabeth was incredibly gracious. She welcomed us into her house. We had a very um, unexpected and fun afternoon talking about Switzerland and her first placement mm -hmm. in the U.S., the Glen Cove Hospital of New York, where my siblings were all born, just coincidentally. And so um, Ken, when I met him, we had a sort of funny exchange about these things. And um, I'm just so grateful. He's been a wonderful supporter of our work here at Mission Hospice. He has... Um, come to our anniversary parties. He presented in person last year, um, maybe the year before actually, because we were in a pandemic last year. <laughs> Back in the old days when Ken could actually come to a room and we could remember the days where we could all get together in a small office and talk to each other. Um, so I know that that would not allow most of you to be here. So I'm really grateful that we have this, um, this opportunity. So Ken, um, Ken's work with the foundation has just expanded the reach of the work that Elizabeth uh, did, the foundational work that she did to provide opportunities for people across the world to die in a way that is um, aligned with their own hopes, their own values, to work in hospital settings, to uh, realign this terrible idea that used to be had that we can't do anything to help people that are dying. So we'll put them at the end of the hall and hope that they go peacefully. And Elizabeth turned that all on its head. And um, the work I do in hospice would not have been possible without the work that she did. Uh, and particularly at the beginning of the hospice movement, Ken, in addition to being um, the president of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation, I just some self-disclosure, I'm on the advisory committee, the advisory council for the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. Ken is an internationally known, recognized photographer and um, a wonderful cat father. So without <laughs> much ado, Ken, I'm gonna spotlight you in the hopes that everybody could see you. I wanna let the group know that we, you will be muted through Ken's presentation, just so you don't inadvertently get a phone call in the middle of this. Um, 
and then we will have time for Q&A. So Ken's going to do about an hour presentation, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And if, there's, um, if you have a question prior to that, feel free to put it up in the chat. And also, what's really wonderful is if you could put up where you're Zooming in from in the chat, because um, it's just wonderful to have you all in this room. So thank you so much. Ken, I'm going to spotlight you. I hope that everybody can see you. And thank you so much for all the work you do and for the um, support you've given to Mission Hospice. Thank you. Um, I just emailed you, Susan. Someone's trying to get in and can't get in. Her name is Lucy, if you could take a look for that. Okie doke. Okay, everyone, let's get this started. Let's see if this works today. Um, we have that. And what am I missing here, Susan? Are you with us? Susan, I guess I lost her. No, I have muted myself. Okay. So you are going to enlarge this just in the PowerPoint. So you could do the slideshow. Yes. Um, I just forgot to click the share sound, but now we're good to go. Beautiful. Thank you, Ken. It looks okay. great. Um, great. Well, it's my first time presenting this, so I hope it works. Um, Susan and I did a little trial, and some of the videos are a little soft, so I'll try to put up the closed captioning so you can hear them. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the pioneers of hospice and the history of hospice. Um, so to me, a, a growing up, I got to meet all these people, which is an amazing, you know, gift. And to me, you know, the four main pioneers, and of course, there's many, many people, hundreds and thousands who did amazing work and devoted their entire lives. But, you know, only a few people can be the first people, right? So... Uh, today, I'll just focus on Dr. Cicely Saunders and Florence Wald, my mom, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and Dr. Balfour Mount. All four of these people are just incredible people and just, you know, what they did. I mean, you know, a lot of people have great ideas. A lot of people participate in the medical community. But what they did really is give structure to these ideas where there was very little structure before. So that's a big deal being able to give structure to a concept. I mean, few people can kind of create something out of nothing. And especially back in the 50s and 60s, you can imagine the system was so geared towards against death and dying, talking about death and dying. It was a really huge deal. When my mom began talking about death and dying in the hallways of the hospital, doctors would literally spit on her and leave her nasty notes and confront her. And, you know, they told her she was a vulture and just total rudeness and you know, really she really kind of had to jump big walls and hurdles to get this work that now doesn't seem like it's that big a deal but just keep keep yourself in the mindset that this is back when these things were not talked about so let's get started here um, obviously a lot of people have talked about death and dying over the years a lot of people have pontificated about it and given us great ideas insights but again you know, these four people gave a structure. So let's go back to the beginning of hospice. When did hospice begin? What year do you think it was? Was it 1967? <laughs> what do you think? Any ideas? Hospice is about a thousand years old, okay? So most people don't know that. It began in the Middle Ages. Pope Urban II called for a crusade. They were sending people to Jerusalem, and they set up these, these lodging houses. And because of the time, a thousand years ago, many people were sick, struggling, had illnesses. They didn't make it. So they ended up becoming homes where people often died. So, you know, the idea of hospice has been around for a thousand years. Um, so let's look at a timeline. You know, people think hospice began in 1967 with Dame Cicely Saunders, and it did to some extent, that's the modern hospice, but the concept of hospice and kind of rough crude hospices have been around all throughout the last thousand years. They've been around in France, Australia, Ireland, London, uh, you know, all over Western countries, we've had the idea of hospice. But the, well, what these were were places to go and die. They focused on the disease, they focused on, you know, sometimes making the people comfortable, but, you know, it's a very rough place. It's not like a hospice now. So Dame Cicely Saunders came along and, you know, everything changed. 
Um, back in 1948, she met a dying Polish refugee from Warsaw, and that man completely changed her life. It just She was horrified at the way this man died, and she began becoming interested in the way people died. 1965, Florence Wald, one of our other important ladies here, invited Saunders to be a visiting faculty member, and uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross began interviewing dying patients, so a very important year in hospice. Uh, Cicely Saunders, Wald, and Kubler-Ross met at the Yale conference. They decided that the system was just horribly flawed, and they had to do something about it. So Cicely had already been working for a number of years to launch a hospice. She'd been raising money, and in 1967, she launched St. Christopher's. Uh, two years later, On Death and Dying came along, and what that did was, you know, it's great having a hospice, but it's no good if society doesn't accept what the hospice is doing. And so while Cicely built the structure, Elizabeth was changing society, and that was very important. Uh, you had to have both components to make hospice a success. 1970, Balfour Mount reads Elizabeth's book and decides to go to England and find out what this hospice is all about. Uh, many, you know, many, many important things were happening at this time. I'm just listing a few of the principal ideas here. So, okay. Um, from 1971 on, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was lecturing to sometimes as many as 5,000 people a week. So that critically changed society, not just in the United States, but she lectured all over the world. I traveled with her to six continents. So this is a way, you know, to make a movement is by going to all these countries around the world and changing society. You know, it was the 60s and beginning of the 70s, and this was the time of the rights movements, and this is when people were beginning to get the idea that, you know, they wanted to challenge the system. And so Elizabeth was challenging society to change the way they were speaking about death and dying. Uh, Battle for Mount went to visit Sicily again. Uh, Florence Wald began the first hospice in the United States in Branford, Connecticut. We had the first symposium on hospice care, which I'm about to show you a video uh, in the next slide. The NHO was formed, which later became the NHPCO, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Um, each of these four people was uh, honored as a founding member of hospice. Um, so I was hoping to find my mom's award, but it's stashed away in a box in the next room. Uh, in 1979, the Healthcare Financing Administration launched 26 hospice programs to study hospice. And finally, in 1982, Congress includes a provision to create Medicare hospice benefits, a big deal. So let's see if this works today. It was working 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I may have to play the videos later. Okay, well, let's just uh, continue on. Um, so let's start with Cicely Saunders. Uh, Cicely, as I mentioned, began her interest in death and dying in, in 1948 uh, while caring for a di dying Polish immigrant. Um, she, she began working at St. Joseph Hospice, which was an early version of hospice, not like we think of it today. And um, she realized by working as a nurse at this hospice that unless you're a doctor, you have no say-so. And so she enrolled in medical school, um, and she, uh, I think she borrowed 500 pounds from uh, a friend of hers. And uh, she got in medical school, became a doctor, and she said that completely changed everything because all the ideas she had tried to impart upon the hospital before, nobody listened to her. But once she became a doctor, people had to listen to her. So unfortunately, you know, the MD made the big difference. Uh, she introduced the concept of specialized care for the dying in the United States at a conference that Florence Wald held in 1963. Um, of course, in 67, she began St. Christopher's, which is still in existence, and she introduced the concept of total pain, which was a really important uh, concept at the time, that total pain is, is more than just the physical pain, 
but it's the emotional pain and the spiritual pain. It's composed of different components. Here's a picture of St. Christopher's back in 67 and what it looks like now. Uh, Florence Wald became interested in the dying in 1963. She was a nurse who later became Dean of the Yale School of Nursing. She left her position after hearing about uh, Cicely Saunders and she made extensive visits over there and it really completely changed her mindset. So uh, in 1971, she began something called Hospice Inc. She began a several year study of hospice and by 74, she felt confident that she could begin the first hospice uh, after Sicily gave her the kind of thumbs up. Now, Florence had this idea that people were either doers or feelers. So she said Balfour, Sicily, and her were doers. And she said Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a feeler. And she said it was a great system to have doers and feelers working together. Both are very different, but both working in harmony together, creating this whole system of hospice. Uh, Sicily uh, and Florence and Elizabeth all worked up until their death, which is amazing. Uh, even when they were very sick, um, you know, Sicily had cancer, my mother was paralyzed, they were still working on her deathbed. So these women were really, really driven. It's really incredible to see how focused they were and nothing, not even their physical ailments, ever slowed them down. So let's see if we can get this one. No, that's not going to work either. <laughs> I knew it. It worked a few minutes ago. Incredible. Ken, you might want to just double check to make sure that you are in uh, slideshow mode to play the videos Slide. in the in the original PowerPoint. Yes. Um, and thank you all like for your patience. We can do this. I'll yeah. show the video separately. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So Dr. Balfour Mount, um, I'm guessing a lot of you don't know much about Balfour, but you know, he was critical in this conversation. Um, and unfortunately, I think he really doesn't get enough credit. Uh, Balfour Mount is the one who came up with the idea, the concept, the word palliative care. I mean, that's huge, right? I mean, you think it's always been around, but Balfour, <laughs> at a fairly late point in you know, our conversation, came up with the, war, the word palliative care. Uh, and he did so because he lived in Canada where they spoke French mm -hmm. and hospice was already used. So he decided to use palliative care to describe the system of care that he was giving dying patients and seriously ill patients. Now I have another video. Uh, it's probably gonna be a little soft, but let's see if this one works. This is Balfour talking about the early days. I've been asked to uh, put on a seminar at a local church uh, on death and dying. Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross had written her book and it was an in topic. I assumed that being a doctor, I must know about death and dying. It didn't occur to me. I didn't know a thing about death and dying. I was reading on death and dying came to the place where she refers to Cecily's work in London. So instinctively, I flipped to the back of the book and saw a reference, Saunders, 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 all the articles on care of the dying and, and their needs uh, written by Cecily. So I picked up the telephone and uh, got the operator and said I wanted to speak to Cecily Saunders in London, England. And, uh, she came on the line and I explained who I was and uh, that I was a surgeon calling from McGill University in Montreal. Told her that I was interested in coming to see what they were doing. And Cecily responded, I can't possibly speak to you now. I'm on my way to lunch, call me in an hour. And hung up and uh, I loved her already. <laughs> and uh, called back in an hour and she said, I know you. And I thought, you do? And she said, you want to come to London with your wife, see a few plays, then come over to St. Christopher's, have a quick walk around and have a look, and then go home. Well, I won't have it. You be prepared to come over, roll your sleeves up, and get to work for a full week, and I'll have you. 
And what Balfour said about that was, and then I knew I really loved her. <laughs> so, um, Balfour is uh, unfortunately the last of the four uh, people alive. He just wrote a book, which should be coming out uh, next month, I believe. It'll be available on Amazon. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, there's a lot I can say about her, of course. But uh, just for this part of the presentation, uh, I'd like to share that in 1945, on the day World War II ended, she ended up joining a peace group and decided she was going to go and rebuild Europe. So imagine, as a teenage girl at 19, she left her family, who said, if you leave the family, we're never going to let you back in. And she said, I don't care. I have to do this. This is the right thing to do. And she hitchhiked into France and began rebuilding villages in France. And from there, she spent two years hitchhiking through Europe. She was in, uh, let's see, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Sweden. Uh, she almost died twice. Uh, and she eventually ended up in Poland. And she had an amazing experience at a concentration camp that really changed her life. But it really got her thinking about death and dying. Uh, so eventually, she went to medical school. And she was working in Chicago. Um, she gave a, she did give a speech in Denver, um, which kind of piqued her interest, but not completely. But by 1965, she really got interested in death and dying, and she was just horrified to see way people the way people were dying at hospitals was just grotesque to her. And so she ended up writing this book on death and dying, and that kind of changed everything. Um, the book is now in its 50th anniversary. Uh, the book has been translated into 40 languages. We just sold it in Arabic, and we're negotiating Mongolian, its 41st language. So it's still very much alive and very popular. <laughs> um, after the book came out, uh, Life Magazine did an article on her work with the dying. And when that came out, she was like an overnight sensation. I mean, people were showing up at the door 24-7 at her house, we had to install a second phone line, and my mom began traveling. Uh, she was giving lectures all around the country, then all around the world. She testified before the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging about the right to die, talking about death with dignity. You know, that was a big thing. I mean, to have some foreign doctor speaking to Congress was very unusual, uh, especially back then. And uh, I ended up traveling to about 20 countries with her, watching her give lectures and workshops, and it was really amazing. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, she would continue to do her work. She was doing uh, many different things, AIDS projects and so forth. In 1985, she announced plans to start an AIDS hospice on her farm in Virginia, and locals did not like that, and eventually burnt down her house. So my mother was a very strong proponent of hospice. I just had an argument with someone the other day who said Elizabeth was not for hospice and didn't support hospice, which is ridiculous. Um, she was definitely, you know, that was a central part of her work. Um, here's a rare photograph of Elizabeth and Cicely together. I think it's the only one I've ever seen. <clears throat> and uh, I've just noted over the years some interesting similarities between Cicely and Elizabeth, besides being totally headstrong women. <clears throat> Uh, both were born in Europe, only 241 miles apart. Both women were heavily influenced by their work with the Polish refugees. My mother at the concentration camp and Cicely had fallen in love with this patient. And when the patient died, it really, you know, profoundly gave her a lot of grief, which she had trouble dealing with. Um, Cicely inherited 500 pounds from this person who died, and my mother borrowed Swiss, 500 Swiss francs from her sister Erica, both to get into medical school. Uh, both had a lot of struggles, were single-minded and incredible listeners. Both were horrified with medical care of the dying. Both were firmly against euthanasia and insisted on complete pain control. And uh, they both thought it was very ironic that the more we progress as a society, the less regard we give to the dying in healthy fashion. Um, so Cicely had this idea of total pain, which was the physical, social, psychological, and spiritual needs. And Elizabeth got the idea, what she called the four quadrants, which she was inspired by Jung, which was her hero growing up. And that was to deal with an impatient uh, in the emotional, intellectual, physical, and spiritual sense. 
She said, you cannot deal and heal a patient unless you're dealing with all four quadrants. Uh, both of them were exceptionally you know, inspiring to Balfour Mount to create palliative care. Both of them worked from their deathbeds, as I mentioned. And now Cicely Saunders, uh, her hospice is tied to King's College in London, and the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation is tied to Stanford University. If you're interested in reading more about these figures, uh, Florence Wald has a book, Prelude to Hospice, that's written about her. Cicely Saunders has a book, Hospice and Palliative Care, which is a great book. I read it a long time ago. And Balfour Mount has this book coming out that he's been working on for at least 10 years. And I'm so glad it's coming out because uh, he's not doing well health-wise, unfortunately. But uh, I believe the Kindle version is available now. And uh, I think the hard copy is coming out either next month or in March. Uh, so here's a quote by each of these leaders. I'll just let you read them yourselves. Okay, um, as I mentioned, my mom was a big proponent of hospice. Uh, a lot of people don't give her her due credit, I think. Maybe I'm biased because I'm her son. Uh, but just some samples of Elizabeth's work was um, she began the first hospice in the Netherlands, which has now been renamed the Elizabeth Kubler Ross House. Uh, that sign says, where there is love, there is life in Dutch. Uh, the Dougie Center was started by my mother's patient, Dougie, who she wrote a letter to. And then she asked a friend to check in on Dougie, uh, Beverly, who ended up starting the Dougie Center. Uh, Suncoast Hospice used to be the biggest hospice chain in the United States. That used to be the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Hospice, which he started. Uh, I was with my mother starting hospices in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Here's one of them, the Shantinalaya Hospice in South Africa. And as I mentioned, my mom tried to start a hospice in uh, Virginia for AIDS babies. And unfortunately, uh, her house was burnt down and she had a stroke the next day, so she was never able to fulfill her dream. So uh, I'm sorry about these lines across the screen. It's uh, I'm not sure Zoom has a mind of its own. Let me see if I can maybe reset it. I'm going to stop the screen share and restart it and yes that cleans it up okay so um i just want to show you a few things that the foundation is doing the elizabeth Kubler ross foundation so we have several hospice projects going on in latin america and here's one we have in chile and of course that's misbehaving too Okay. My, my mother is playing games from the great beyond here, so I am going to... I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> she always does this. So I'm going to play the video a different way just to uh, hopefully get this working with you. Can you see this, Susan? I can see the... Um, yes, I can see the photo for the foundation. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yo soy Mónica Gana, directora ejecutiva de la Fundación Casa Sagrada Familia en Santiago de Chile. Nosotros hace ya 17 años recibimos a niños oncológicos de provincia que se tienen que trasladar para recibir su tratamiento. En estos 17 años los hemos acompañado, hemos sido familia de ellos, eh, le hemos dado un hogar, alimentación, transporte, todo lo que necesitan para recibir un tratamiento de la mejor manera posible. Sin embargo, en este tiempo eh, no todos nuestros niños se sanan, sino que hay un 25% de ellos que el tratamiento no funciona. Y acá en Chile ellos se ven obligados a volver a su lugar de origen. En este caso son regiones aisladas del país que no tienen los cuidados paliativos necesarios y ven que su vida va a estar limitada. Entonces para nosotros es una etapa muy triste y es un dolor muy profundo de tener que dejar partir a nuestros niños. Tenemos toda la intención de dar una compañía durante los cuidados paliativos, pero mi equipo no está capacitado y para nosotros es fundamental contar con personas que conocen del tema y que nos pueden dar ese apoyo. Entonces ahí cuando nos acercamos con Eva de la Fundación Elizabeth Kubler a soñar en dar un, una solución a este problema. 
Mi nombre es Eva Melander Angure, soy la directora de la Fundación Elizabeth Culerro Chile y en este momento estamos absolutamente felices por poder eh, estar acompañando un gran sueño, el sueño de la Fundación Casa Sagrada Familia, porque nos va a permitir cumplir nuestra misión, esta misión que queremos eh, desarrollar en Chile, inspirado eh, en lo que nos enseñó Elizabeth Culler en crear básicamente un entorno de amor incondicional, de cuidados paliativos, pediátricos, profesionales, especializados, para que puedan vivir esta etapa y este proceso de la manera más natural posible. La Fundación Casa Sagrada Familia, en alianza con la Fundación Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Chile y con el respaldo de Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation, ha decidido crear el primer hospice pediátrico de Chile y en general de todo el cono suramericano en el hospice Niñas, niños y adolescentes de escasos recursos económicos y sin red de apoyo social que se encuentran afrontando junto a sus familias una enfermedad avanzada, crónica, degenerativa de tipo oncológico o no oncológico. Encontrarán un segundo hogar para vivir hasta partir en compañía de sus familiares, rodeados de amor incondicional y de cuidados paliativos pediátricos compasivos y profesionales. El terreno donde se construirá el primer hospice pediátrico de Chile fue amorosamente donado por Fundación San Vicente de Paul, ubicado en Santiago de Chile, en la Comuna de Independencia. El hospice contará con un programa de cuidados paliativos pediátricos en el hogar para nueve familias, nueve habitaciones adecuadas para niños, sus padres y hermanos. En el modelo de interacción, y con un programa de cuidados paliativos pediátricos domiciliarios, con el que nos proponemos acompañar anualmente a cerca de 100 familias. Amigos de la doctora Elizabeth Kubler-Ross del Mundo, gracias por ayudarnos a construir el primer hospice pediátrico de Chile, inspirado en sus enseñanzas y especialmente en su amor incondicional hacia los niños y sus familias. Elizabeth Kuller tenía un gran sueño y era que los niños y las familias pudieran vivir. So Susan, are you saying you can't see this or? Yes, Ken, what I'm saying is that the um, slideshow isn't advancing and because it's only in Spanish, there's no, we're not seeing mm -hmm. subtitles. So Mabel was saying she might put something up so we could understand what's being said, but I think that's a lot in terms of translating. How people are yeah, speaking. I think that's too much. <laughs> it's a lot because it's a lot that's being said. Okay. I'm, so we're cursed with technology today. We have, yes. Yeah, so all three of the things that we did like 45 minutes ago that worked perfectly is now. <laughs> so we're learning all a lot about how to soften our bellies, expand our patience. And yes, thank you, Yvonne. Life is full of glitches. So if this is really <laughs> difficult, we can imagine how hard dying is going to be. <laughs> So I just try to give this lots of space. Thanks, Ken. Uh, shall I try one more video of Florence? Yes, it would be great if we could see the video of Florence. And I think that when you're putting them up in the slideshow, uh, it would be great if you could do it in, uh, the, in, the, in the PowerPoint to do it in slideshow, which I think is one of the features at the very top that we uh, looked at before. Um, I don't have anything at the top right now. Uh, this is just a pure video off my screen. Beautiful. Off that will work. Just make okay. sure to do the screen share and the in the um, the computer okay. sound. Thank you. So we have that. Let's try that now. Beginning in 1959, I was here yes. at the yes. School of Nursing, first as an acting dean and then became dean. But we had the responsibility for revamping a program to teach nurses who already had college degrees and uh, to uh, be able to uh, research what their nursing practice was affecting. I was present at the uh, first conference uh, at the Yale School of Nursing when Florence Wall invited Mr. Saunders and myself to come over and talk to the nurses. We just gathered in a big room, something like this, a classroom, and around a big table. And uh, we'd had, uh, uh, we had no kind of preparation for it at all. All we wanted to do was to hear her. <laughs> but I did have some statistics by that time. <laughs> because I, I was able to yeah. put statistics together with stories. Yes. Because I had to reach not just the nurses, but the physicians as well. Yeah. They gave her a standing ovation. And uh, Yale Medical Students don't do that very easily. But... 
Okay, could you all hear that? Well, can they're mute? People are muted, so maybe they could oh, put okay. in the chat what. Um, oh, maybe they'd give me a yes or no. Yeah, in the chat. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. So, anyway, let's move on since that one seems to be having some trouble. Um, and we'll do part two here, which I've done in the past and I never had troubles, but <laughs> today <laughs> we're having troubles with everything. Welcome so. to 2021. I'm just going to say that Mercury is in retrograde, whether it is or not. I thought this year would go so much smoother. <laughs> so can you see that, Susan? <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you, Ken. So let's try part two, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. <laughs> um, so one thing, you know, I love talking about my mother, not because I'm an egotist, but because, you know, when you read about Elizabeth in the media, all you hear about are the five stages or some controversy about Elizabeth talking to spirits. But Elizabeth was an incredibly fascinating character. Even if I wasn't her son, she's amazing in what she accomplished in a very short time. She began her work roughly when she was about 40 years old and retired in her 60s. And in that time, she you know, helped begin the hospice movement, thanatology movement, palliative care movement. She changed bioethics. She did AIDS projects vet projects, workshops. She wrote 24 books. She went to dozens of countries. She answered hundreds of thousands of letters. She was a practicing doctor, a mother. She had a working farm. And this is in 25 years. I mean, it's just incredible, you know? So when you think of Elizabeth, please do not think of the five stages because that was not what Elizabeth's work was all about. <clears throat> So, of course, she did do this one book, and a lot of people come to me and say, oh, Ken, you know, your mom did this great book. And I go, well, you know, she did, but she did two dozen books, maybe more. <clears throat> um, so the book is very popular. Uh, one thing I want to point out, which is just incredible, is that they cannot even put MD or doctor on any of these covers. I mean, really, it's a 21st century, and they can't even acknowledge that this woman is a doctor. It's really disgraceful. <clears throat> You see, yeah, it's just, <laughs> that really irks me. <laughs> um, so why is the book important? Why do we talk about it 50 years later? Well, for example, the New York Public Library named this book one of the 100 books of the century, along with Freud, Margaret Mead, Timothy Leary, and under Mind and Spirit, here's On Death and Dying. So the New York Public Library considers it one of the 100 most important works out of all the bazillions of books written in the 20th century. So that says something. Um, also, Elizabeth was named one of the 100 most uh, influential thinkers and scientists of the 20th century. Pretty remarkable because they only had very few women on that list. So my mother was under a category of unsung heroes. So I think that's pretty appropriate. Uh, a lot of people come to me and say, well, you know, your mom did those stages, but, you know, she really stole them from John Bowlby or somebody else. So I go, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is like completely fantasy. Uh, my mother told me several times that she got the idea of stage theory from her associate and friend, Anna Freud. And it's very ironic because my mother was a Jungian so for a Jungian to get her most famous idea from a Freud is pretty ironic, right? So anyway, this is where she got it from. She did not get it from Bowlby. She did not get it from Parks. You know, any of these other workers who were working in the 60s and 70s, she totally got the idea, you know, from the ego and the mechanisms of defense from Anna Freud. <laughs> Something else that's unknown about the book and it's very interesting is that it has 12 chapters, but when she wrote it, she wrote a 13th chapter, and that chapter was about life after death. This is in the 60s, right? So everyone says, well, Elizabeth started talking about life after death, you know, in the late 70s when she was hanging out with these gurus in California. That's not true. You know, in the 60s, she was interviewing patients, and many of them had stories about NDEs, near-death experiences. And so she wrote a 13th chapter on this, and both her publisher and her best friend insisted that she take it out. They said it was so far out just to talk about death and dying out in the open that if she included life after death or near-death experiences, nobody would buy the book or take her seriously and it would damage her career. 
so unfortunately she had to take it out and I've never been able to find the missing chapter. Uh, later, of course, she did many books on it. These are among her best-selling books. Um, but the missing 13th chapter has never been found. So as I mentioned, on Death and Dying, we look at the cover and we see, like Ira Bayak, he's a doctor, but apparently my mother's not a doctor. <laughs> so, really gave Simon Schuster a lot of grief about that. Um, but half the book is stories about what the dying have to teach doctors, nurses, clergy, and their own families. So the book is not just about the five stages. The book was, you know, heavily uh, pushing the idea that people should die at home. So it was pushing the hospice movement. It was pushing palliative care. It was pushing thanatology. You know, I'm not saying she invented any of these things, but this book was the cornerstone of the movement of all these ideas. Because without changing society, as I mentioned, you cannot, you know, do these things because people wouldn't accept them. And Elizabeth is writing books. She's speaking to thousands of people a week. She's doing hundreds of articles. And this entirely changed society. In addition, this book changed bioethics medicine. Um, the American Journal of Bioethics just did an entire journal uh, devoted to the 50th anniversary of this book. And basically, without mentioning the stages, so they get it that this book is not just about stages. Uh, this book changed the doctor-patient relationship. And this book normalized grief to some extent, because before this, grief was talked about as crisis management and all these ridic ridiculous things that, you know, are not very accurate. Um, if you're interested in Elizabeth's work, as I mentioned, she wrote many, many books. Here are just a few of them. Uh, this book on grief and grieving, as of two days ago, was ranked number 6,021 out of 32 million books, right? So her work is still accepted, still very important, and still sells very, very well. <clears throat> if you're interested in reading more about Elizabeth from another perspective, here are a number of books written about Elizabeth. Uh, the book Quest is great. Some of these books are, as you can see, in Portuguese, Spanish, French, um, but there are a number of books in English, including this one, Tea with Elizabeth. That was a great book. Uh, we wrote that just after my mom died. Um, and then my mother, of course, did a number of forwards for very important books. Uh, she worked with Viktor Frankl. She worked with Raymond Moody, Joan Halifax. You know, so there's a lot out there by Elizabeth, uh, hundreds of chapters and so forth. So she was very prolific and did a lot more than just on death and dying. <clears throat> so the five stages, I have to give that a mention because you know what you read in the media is so ridiculous. It, <laughs> it barely describes anything that she talked about. <clears throat> so this is how the five stages are talked about you know, in the media, in popular media. Uh, people criticizing Elizabeth describe the stages as this, but the fact is, if you look in the book on page 251, this is the chart that describes the stages. So you can clearly see here, and you know, you go to any bookstore and see this, it's not just my copy, <laughs> it's not my imagination, Elizabeth is talking about 10 stages here. Why is that? Why is it that in 51 years, nobody has ever mentioned Elizabeth's 10 stages of grief, or the 13 stages. She talks about shock. She talks about preparatory grief, uh, anticipatory grief, partial denial. She talks about hope. She talks about, she mentions anxiety as being a part of grief 14 times. So how is it that no article has ever mentioned this? It's incredible. It's like they criticize her, but they don't actually criticize what she actually wrote about. So uh, this is where I have a lot of issues, and the foundation tries to contradict this kind of false narrative of Elizabeth's work. Um, so I went on Google and I picked out the first couple of criticisms and here they are again, they're fixed sequence, smooth and predictable path, proper order, there's no stages. So this is from another one of Elizabeth's books, Everyone's Grief is Unique. These tools help frame and identify what we may be feeling. Not everyone goes through all of them or goes through them in a prescribed order. This is Elizabeth's own words in her books. So how is it possible that she's constantly criticized every week, you know, for something she didn't say? It's, it's really shocking. 
Um, so this is uh, another example of Elizabeth's five stages. <clears throat> you see here, she's talking about hope. This is a chart that Elizabeth drew out. And she repeatedly said that the book is not meant to be a textbook, how to manage dying patients. It's not intended to be a complete psychological study of the dying. It's just a review of several hundred case examples and my observations. And what she was trying to say was that grief was complex. She didn't care if you believed in five stages or 10 or 15. She, you know, at the time, the concept that grief was made of different components was a radical idea. And that's what she was trying to say. She said, it doesn't matter how many stages or if there's no stages. I just want you to know that grief is made up of different components. Now, again, this is another chart from my mother. And here, you know, again, she's trying to show that grief and the stages or phases or periods or whatever you want to call them is not linear. This is my mother's actual chart. She talks about hope. She talks about dreams. You know, she says they overlap, they occur together. If you look at her um, book, you know, here she's saying that the families will go through a phase of preparatory grief just as the dying person does. So here she's talking about another stage that no one ever mentions, preparatory grief, which is now known as anticipatory grief. Um, I'm going to skip this because yeah. we're running out of time. Uh, if you look at her second book, uh, she says, do not follow the classical pattern of stage from denial, anger, bargaining. She says that most of my patients exhibited two or three stages simultaneously. So these are Elizabeth's own words. So, you know, please do not believe what you read in the media because unfortunately <laughs> there's a lot of false information out there. I hate to say fake media, but in this case, it's completely true. Um, since the five stages came out 50 years ago, uh, they've begun evolving to some degree, uh, not by my mother so much, but, but by the public. So the five stages have now become the grief cycle, the Kubler-Ross model, the Kubler-Ross change curve. We have hundreds and hundreds of companies coming to us asking if they can have permission to use the Kubler-Ross change curve. We had Boeing come to us, IBM, Microsoft, Apple, all the biggest companies in the world use the five stages as the Kubler-Ross change curve now to describe loss, change, and, and different ideas that they want to train their employees with. You know, so on one hand, everyone's, not everyone, but many people are bashing the five stages as being disproven, and at the same time, you know, many of the biggest companies in the world are using them. Uh, we even had the BBC recently say the five stages are no longer used, but in the same article, they said they use them to train their workers. You know, this is just nonsensical. But, you know, 50 years later, we're still debating the five stages. Um, and again, they've evolved. So here we have the 22 stages of grief, the roller coaster of change, dealing with loss in nine stages, the sorrow model. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. It just never stops. So my mother was really finished with the stages by 1974, 75. She really didn't want to talk about it anymore. And she had a lot more to say. And one of the most important ideas is the four quadrants, as I mentioned in the first presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the four quadrants, or total pain as Cicely Saunders would describe it, is made up of the physical, emotional, intellectual, and the spiritual. So she said, as we start off in life, everything is about the physical. When you're a baby, we just take, uh, take care of the physical needs. As we begin getting older, you begin taking care of emotional needs. As we get into our teen years, it's the intellectual needs. And then as we get even older, we begin to develop our, our soul or spiritual quadrant. And she says, as we get much older in our senior years, it begins to often go in reverse. And so that in the end, all we're taking care of is the physical quadrant. And she said, always remember to take care of all four quadrants. So here's my mother talking about the four quadrants and hopefully uh, we have this one working and you'll be able to hear it. Human beings, in my opinion, and that's just one model, consist of four quadrants. You can hear it if you don't see it. The physical, 
the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual. All human beings consist of the same. Some of them like to deny it, but that's their problem. When you work with dying patients, and I started originally only with grown-ups, only later when I had children of my own, when I had a, a boy and a girl, I realized that I'm shying away from dying children because every dying child, every dying boy reminded me of my boy, every dying girl reminded me of my girl, and I knew that I had to do something about it. And then I moved to La Rabida Children's Hospital, where there were mainly dying children, and I saw the children are much easier, much less phony balonies, much more honest. And they're wonderful to talk to, and they're terrific teachers. And I often say there are only three kinds of honest people left in the world. One of them are psychotics. The others are dying patients who have very little time left, so they throw overboard all the baloney. And the other one are young children before we contaminate them. So if you really want good teachers for your own life, work with psychotics or children or dying patients. And they are wonderful and they give you more than you give them. And I mean that literally. So very briefly, if you work with dying patients, and this is a general rule of thumb, you always start with the physical quadrant. When you start growing up a family and you have a newborn baby, you only take care of the physical needs the first year of life. That is priority one at the beginning of life and again at the end of life. You take care of the physical quadrant, babies who are lot of uh, laughed, hugged, touched, smooched, held, rocked, you give them the foundation of life. They should have physical contact in the whole first year of life as much as humanly possible. Uh, some of you know René Spitz's book on the first year of life, and you know what happens when babies are never touched and loved. They may have nurses around the clock, and they may have all the right formulas, and they die like flies because they don't have that physical loving, hugging touch. Same thing with the terminally ill people. They need to be hugged and touched. Okay, so besides the four quadrants, um, uh, um, she she was really into everything being circles, um, despite the idea of the five stages being a linear <laughs> idea. Um, she was really into circles and wheels, so everything she did, you know, even the four quadrants is a wheel, right? But she talked about in nature we have winter, spring, fall, summer. We have day and night. We have uh, this idea by Jung. Um, her center in California was all about wheels. This is from the Dougie letter, uh, which became the Dougie Center. Um, but, you know, many things in my mom's life were circles. She said, you know, life is a circle. We, we're born, we live, and we go back to the place that we come from. So circles and wheels were a very central concept in Elizabeth's work. Another uh, central idea was drawing interpretation. Uh, she said a lot of people, uh, patients are using symbolic verbal and nonverbal language. She said, dealing with dying patients is great to do a drawing interpretation. So there's a book by her associate, Greg Firth, called The Secret World of Drawings. And she used this extensively, even with my sister and I, to kind of analyze what was going on in our heads. And she said, you can learn a lot about a patient, you know, especially if they don't want to communicate through drawing interpretation. Um, listening. Uh, as I mentioned in the first presentation, Cicely Saunders and Elizabeth were just masters at listening. That was the whole thing. She said, my book on death and dying is all about listening. She said, don't impose your beliefs. Don't talk to them when you're comfortable. When a dying patient wants to talk, you have to be ready to listen. And you have to listen, you know, with all your quadrants, with all your senses, not just with your ears, but with your heart, with your mind, with every, you know, ability you have, tune into the patient. What are they really saying? So let's uh, hear Elizabeth talking about listening. When I started this work, I was very much hated for sitting with dying patients and making the hospital famous for dying patients. And a decade later, I received so many doctor degrees, I can't even count them. And I don't understand that because I've never invented anything. 
I've never done anything except sit with people and listen to them and hear them. So listening, very important in Elizabeth's work. <clears throat> um, besides, I was talking about death and dying. You know, what she found was that many people are afraid to die because they haven't lived well. They haven't lived fully. They've been afraid to live fully. She said these fears kind of stop us from, you know, living our maximum potential. And because of this, people are afraid to die. She said if people could only live their lives fully, they would never be afraid to die because they would feel like they didn't waste this beautiful gift. And so she began doing these life, death, and transition workshops all around the world. Uh, they're still going on today. And through the workshops, uh, there were five-day workshops of externalization. And she would get people to kind of just let out their fear, anger, rage, their repressed feelings that they hadn't shared. And through that, they would be able to live fully and therefore have a better death. Um, so if you want to learn more about the workshops, go to the externalizationworkshops.com. Here are some books by Jacob Watson and Larry Lincoln, who are some of the workshop leaders. Elizabeth talks about it in her book, Working It Through, which is available in a number of different languages. Um, but a very important component of Elizabeth's work. Countertransference. You know, another big aspect of Elizabeth's work, she said, how can a doctor who hasn't dealt with their own fear, especially their fear of death, communicate with a dying patient? She said it's impossible. It's, it's ridiculous. The concept is so far out, like how do medical schools even let people graduate, you know, without you know, asking doctors how they feel about death, but without having these classes to externalize their own fears because there's no way you can talk to a dying patient about death when you haven't dealt with your own unfinished business. So she said the problem with doctors working with dying patients is countertransference. They're projecting their own fears onto the patients. She said within a few seconds, a patient's gonna smell your fear, you know? So she said, really, if you wanna deal with dying patients, work on your own stuff first, and then you can deal with other people. Symbolic verbal and nonverbal language, very important in Elizabeth's work. Um, I have a video now of Elizabeth talking about that. It's important that we teach that there is not only, you know, the common language that we are familiar with, but that there is also a symbolical language and a nonverbal language. Uh, for teaching purposes, we put it together into three languages that dying patients use when they try to convey to you their own awareness of their impending death. The simplest language is plain English. If an old woman says to you, I know I have cancer and I'm not getting out of this hospital anymore, everybody knows what she's talking about, that she talks about her dying. Those patients are understood by anybody, lay people and professional people, but those are the patients who need you the least because anybody who can talk about their own impending death in plain English is usually has come to grips with their own finiteness and is usually at least partially at peace with their own death. And that means that they end up helping you more than the other way around. The people who need help, who need our help very much, are people who are afraid to die, are children uh, who have no language to talk about dying because we raise them in a way that they are not familiar with death as a normal part of life. We have these horrible signs in the hospitals. No children are allowed in the hospital under age 14 or 16, which I find a shame. Uh, children who have to die, or adolescents who are just starting to live and then they have to die. Uh, also young adults and patients who come into the hospital and have a very short time between an accident and their actual death. So they have very little time to come to grips with their own death or old people who are petrified to die. All these patients who need us terribly much use a symbolical language. And there are two kinds of symbolical languages. One is a symbolical nonverbal language that is used almost exclusively by young children between the ages of three and 10. And a symbolical verbal language which is used by older children, adolescents and grown-ups. And I can give you an example of each of these languages. In order to understand the symbolical language, you have to understand what the fear of death is. 
Uh, most people, if I ask, what are you so afraid of? Why do we feel so negative and so helpless and so petrified when we walk into a room of a dying patient? Well, it's because they remind us that we are finite too. And then I said, yeah, what is so terrible about that? It should be beautiful because if our lifespan would not be limited, you couldn't enjoy living if it would go on forever and ever and ever. But people don't see it this way. They are afraid of the unknown. Uh, some people are afraid of punishment after death. I would be afraid of leaving my small children behind. Every human being has their own associations with the fear of death. But this is a very small part and almost an irrelevant part of the fear of death. The real fear of death... So, uh, we could go on and on with that, but I just want to give you a small taste of Elizabeth talking about uh, symbolic, verbal, and nonverbal language. Important. Um, as I mentioned, one of Elizabeth's critical uh, experiences in her younger life was uh, going to this concentration camp. Um, she met a girl who had seen her entire family gassed to death right in front of her. And Elizabeth said, you must be so angry at the Germans. What are you going to do with your life now? And she said, you know, I've actually decided to go help Germans rebuild their villages. And Elizabeth was just shocked. She said, why on earth would you want to help the Germans after what they did to your family, especially like you witnessing it right in front of your eyes? And she said, you know, if I fill my heart with hatred and disgust and anger, then I'm no better than the Nazis. I want to learn something from this experience. And my mother thought about that for years, and she realized that anyone can take any experience and become either a Mother Teresa or a Hitler, but it's up to them to decide what they do with that experience. And Elizabeth really used that um, when she was working with dying patients because she said, you know, if that girl could face that horrible situation with bravery and love in her heart, then we can face anything, you know, and it's up to us to decide how we see the glass, half full or half empty. And another experience Elizabeth had in the concentration camps is that she saw the children uh, just before they were murdered, had drawn butterflies in the walls with their fingernails, in the wooden walls. And she saw that over and over and over, and for years she thought about that, and she realized that the children understood that their souls would float above their bodies after they would die. And she thought, wow, children really know so much more about death than we give them credit for. And so when she began the hospice movement, she used the butterfly as a symbol for it, and I think that's why we see it now. Uh, as I mentioned, the American Journal of Bioethics just did this wonderful uh, issue on Elizabeth. Um, you can get some of the articles online, um, but you can just see by some of the titles here that they really appreciate Elizabeth's contribution to palliative care and bioethics, and that On Death and Dying, while it's known for being about the five stages, really is so much more than just that. I mean, it's a very myopic view of On Death and Dying. But the, the whole book is about all those topics I mentioned, palliative care, bio, bioethics, and the doctor-patient relationship. So I really strongly encourage you to see if you can get a copy of this journal. It's a really an incredible piece that really, I think, accurately reflects upon Elizabeth's contributions through On Death and Dying. So this is me growing up with Elizabeth. Um, you know, she was a regular mom for the first nine years of my life. Uh, as regular as she could be. She was, you know, already a, a kind of Swiss hillbilly living out of place in America. But, um, you know, we had many wonderful adventures together. Uh, she was not around much, so, you know, often I'd only see her on trips, but we'd have these incredible, crazy adventures all around the world. And, uh, you know, I ended up going to 20 countries with her. And, you know, it was just a fantastic experience. So some people say, oh, your mother was a bad mother. She, she didn't stick around and raise you. And I go, no, no, no. She really taught me a lot about life and death. And I really have no issues with her. Obviously, I started a foundation for her. And I took care of her the last nine years of her life. So, you know, how many issues can I have with my mother for not being there, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, you know, I don't have time to tell you the stories today. But uh, on another presentation, I'll be happy to share some stories with you. Um, yeah, we went to Africa a number of times together, Egypt. Uh, my mom wanted to see the, the lava in Hawaii. The volcano was exploding, so we got a biplane and did loop-de-loops over a live volcano so she could see the smoke and feel the flames. And uh, really, it was just an amazing adventure growing up with Elizabeth. 
So I'm just going to end. I think we're just about out of time here. Is that right, Susan? Getting close? You know, Ken, I think if you have other things that you would like to say, there's been some questions. I think that we have time for those. Um, definitely we have time for those. And um, if there's other things you would like to say here, please feel free. I can say endless things about Elizabeth. I but, know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I just want to share a few more stories then. Um, the one story that really stands out is the Rose story. My father did not believe in life after death. He was brought up in a Jewish American background. His father died when he was seven years old in Brooklyn, leaving the family $56. And he somehow got a scholarship and went to medical school in Switzerland. Even though he didn't speak German, he went to medical school in Switzerland. Can you imagine? I mean, medical school is tough enough in English, but to study in a foreign language that you don't speak. I mean, the man was brilliant. So I really got to give him a lot of credit. Uh, he ended up meeting my mother. They shared the same cadaver in medical school. Very romantic. So, um, but anyway, growing up with my parents, they're both doctors, they're both brilliant. And, you know, they would constantly politely argue at the dinner table about life after death. And one day, my father said to my sister, when she was only six or seven years old, I'm going to send you flowers on the first snowfall after I die. And my sister and I are like, why did dad say that? He doesn't believe in life after death. That makes no sense. Why are parents so weird? <laughs> so 25 years later, I'm living with my father here in Arizona. And he says, go out and send your sister some flowers tomorrow for her birthday. This is before the internet. So I went out, I sent a dozen roses, and I came back. And my father had died in his afternoon nap. He had a bad heart. So my sister is living in Seattle, which is not a place known for snow. But the next day, my sister comes home, and they had a freak snowstorm. There was a dozen roses in the snow on her front doorstep 25 years later. So, of course, my mother thought, ah, I knew it. I was right. <laughs> so she had the last word. Uh, my parents had a very unusual relationship. They divorced in the 70s, but they were still friends. And my mother used to show up for holidays with his new wife there. <laughs> it's just, my family is always very unusual. So she would show up at Christmas and Thanksgiving without any invitation, without any announcement. She would just show up. And luckily, my stepmother put up with it. So, <laughs> But uh, they always had a, a funny and unusual relationship even after they divorced. So here's my mom collecting dolls for the A's Hospice in Virginia. Uh, I guess it went on for about 18 months. She was struggling with the community and saying she's still going to do it, and they wouldn't give her a permit, and she said she didn't care. She started getting death threats. Guys with shotguns would hang out in front of her farm. People would shoot bullets through her windows, and she didn't care, and this is what ended up happening to her house. So it was the second time her house was arsoned. It was also uh, partially burnt down in California. She was always very controversial, which I found unusual, given that she was just trying to help dying people. And then the next day, she had a small stroke, a TIA. Uh, so I ended up moving her down to Arizona. Um, and she was very angry because she had a stroke and she was paralyzed. But uh, the, again, you know, the newspapers and media have really misrepresented my mother's anger uh, and said, you know, she sits alone all day long, and, you know, which she did say sometimes. But uh, let's take a look at Elizabeth towards the end of her life. Oprah came down to do an interview with her. And uh, let's see Elizabeth's personality. This is about two and a half years after her major stroke down here in Arizona. Arizona to talk to Elizabeth again. Great to see you after all these years. Do you remember? You yes. have the big apple. A big That's apple. Like a member. Big apple. Yeah. Elizabeth says she's ready to die, but she's not going gently. She's as feisty <laughs> and opinionated as ever. And from this Swiss country doctor's lifelong research on death and dying, we can all take away lessons about living and the wheel of life. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has written a new book, her last called The Wheel of Life. It is an autobiography, and during our recent visit, I asked her to talk about how she feels now that she is reaching the end of her life. Tell us exactly what it is you have and what has caused this debilitation. I had a stroke on Mother's Day. Uh -huh. What year? Two and a half years ago. Two and a half years now. On the left side. Mm -hmm. 
And then I had a frozen shoulder, and then I got kidney stones, then I broke my hip, one thing after another. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in a chair 15 hours a day like a zombie, not able to do anything. When you were 15 hours a day in the chair, were you hoping for your own death? Oh, every day, every minute. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't stand it. So are you in the process now? Or do you think you are, are you fighting to live or are you willing There are days to when I'm up to here and don't want to any part of it and there are days when I think maybe it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Did you go through those stages yourself of denial? I was angry, angry, angry and enraged. Nothing but anger and negative. So no denial for you? No, are you kidding? No. <laughs> no denial. <laughs> Just no angry. bargaining. No bargaining. I gave God hell. I called him every name in the book in every language. Mm -hmm. No bargaining. No depression? No. Depression came afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then you started to accept it or not? Well, I, I'm accepting it, but I'm accepting to die would be great. But I now I have to start from scratch again. That I'm very leery about. Starting from scratch, you yeah. mean becoming ill all over and again, the, or no, to get well and to live mm -hmm. is much harder when you're ready to take off. It's like you're boarding the plane and they don't take off, and you sit and wait and don't know are they going or not. Well, when you spin your okay, so that was my mother towards the end of her life. Uh, a few years later, she ended up getting s systemic infections and uh, eventually died in 2004. Um, she had a great send-off. We had a three-day party. Hundreds of people showed up from around the world. Uh, we had a black gospel choir come down on stage and sing and dance with her with her coffin. And um, I thought I'd get my life back, but uh, a few days later, a woman showed up from India who had flown there all the way from India just to meet my mother. And I said, you just missed her. And so we ended up talking for the afternoon, and she said she was so inspired just going to see the room where my mom died that she was going to go back to India and start this hospice. And so I thought, wow, you know, my mom's legacy is still so powerful. So I ended up starting this foundation 15 years ago, and uh, here I am 15 years later, still doing it. And uh, we have groups in a dozen countries now. We have interest from eight more countries, and uh, we've met many wonderful people along the line like uh, Susan. So I think that'll be it for today. I apologize for the technical issues with the first presentation. I did it the same way I did this one, but for some reason it didn't seem to want to work today. Uh, I tested it three times. It worked fine. We did. Tested it with Susan. We did. Almost fine. Almost <laughs> fine. <laughs> Not so fine. But Ken, thank you. It was really beautiful. And before you turn off your screen, or when you turn off your screen, I'm just going to remind people that this is being recorded and that our hope is to put it up on our YouTube channel so that you can share this with friends, you can revisit this. And so if you do not want to be seen on our YouTube channel, please do turn off your uh your camera. Ken, um, there's just so many things. I, there are some questions and we're, I'm going to want, yes, we want people to know how to raise their hand for most of you. Mm -hmm. If you click at the bottom or top of your screen, you click participant and there'll be a little hand icon. If you raise that, then we're able to track that. Also, if you, um, there's a new version of Zoom and you have a button at the bottom or top called reactions. And if you open that, then just below the little list of other things you can do, there's a place to raise your hand. Doing it that way allows me to track who wants to speak and um, the order in which you raise your hand. Before, um, yes, yeah, so that's so interesting. So I'm speak, so somebody can, of course, these things, the circle always happens this way. There's a woman, uh, Mabel, who is interested in being in touch with you because she'd like to start a center in Chile. Oh, Maybe. And one of wow. our staff members has just sent me a chat out here saying, who can we contact if we want to volunteer at some point in a pediatric hospice in Chile? She's working at Mission Hospice, but has um, Chilean. So I want to thank you so much for your talk. When you were talking about listening, which, of course, for anybody working in hospice, um, one of our wonderful hospice nurses and a longtime friend of mine will talk about hospice as being the laying on of ears that our job in hospice is really to listen deeply at the person who we are with to support them in that way.
And um, Ken is posting his email for those of you. And I just re was so reminded, um, I saw your mom speak before we met her at her house. I saw her speak about uh, in the 90s with a friend of mine. I brought him. He had AIDS. He was quite ill at the time. I told him we would never, I'd never make him do anything else, which is what I had promised him, except we were going to this talk. Mm -hmm. We drove to Palo Alto. The place was packed. It was so hard for him to get in. We sat in the last row. He complained through the whole thing. Your mother was hilarious. She did the whole talk with the lights off mm -hmm. so she could see the audience and with sunglasses on. Oh, yes. And um, at the end of the talk, I made Bill go up to the front of the stage. And the only seat really was the one on the stage. And he just clambered up there and got on. And your mom was engaged with probably a couple dozen people in the front of the stage. She was kneeling over speaking to them. As soon as he took his seat, she just stopped and she turned around and came right over to him and put one hand behind his back. I just want to cry when I think about this because he was so frustrated. His AIDS dementia was kind of over the top then. It took nothing to frustrate him. She put her hand on her heart and he, she said, how was that? And he just said, I couldn't hear anything. And she said, you've heard everything you need and it's right in here. And she touched his heart again and he just began crying. And um, I think that moved him so deeply. It was just such a beautiful thing to witness. And then last week, we've been doing some work, as you know, with the uh, Humane Prison Hospice Project. Mission Hospice supported a project in San Quentin, teaching um, a compassionate end-of-life class for prisoners there. And um, your mom I was instrumental in getting prisons to have hospice programs. There are very few in, pro in prison right now, but she was instrumental in beginning the first one, which is at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California. And I got a letter from one of the prisoners who had taken the first class we offered at the end of 2008. 18 and into 2019 and he just talked about how powerless they all were there to do anything at all during the covid epidemic except what he learned in the um, compassion end of life training he said i knew uh, you talked a lot about just compassionately listening but we always want to do so much and when we can't do anything being able to compassionately listen is everything to the other person and it just also touched me so deeply listening to you talk about that value um and I, we're going to send out an email. This will be um, posted and there will be uh, mm -hmm. in the email also some resources. I'll include Ken's email and the Elizabeth Kutzler Ross Foundation and the talk about um, symbolic language. One of the people I heard recently who is the president of the EK of the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation in Mexico, Wilka Roque, will be speaking on symbolic language at end of life with us in February. And I recommend, I cannot recommend her highly enough. It's a remarkable talk she gave. So the symbolic language and understanding that, I think that's something hospice volunteers and uh, hospice folks, they navigate that with their patients beautifully. And it's, um, it's really wonderful to have somebody that can speak so eloquently about that. And I do see a question here, um, Edie has her hand up. And also Alan had a question earlier that I can ask or Alan, I'd encourage you to ask that. But Edie, can you um, unmute yourself, please? That might be Eddie. I think my mother is definitely been happy. I've been thinking about her. your mom this whole experience. My, yes. my, my chat is moving itself. Like it's scrolling and I'm not touching anything and it's just going crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Ken, you had a question earlier, I believe. Um, Alan, do you want to ask the question, Alan, from Dublin or would you like me to scroll back and find your question? You could, oh, you know what? Here's the thing. I'm so sorry, everybody. Now you can unmute yourself, Eddie and um, Alan. Why don't you go first, Eddie? You're unmuted now. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. And Ken, uh, what a wonderful presentation. I've loved your mother's work uh, since I was, uh, oh, in my early 20s um, when I was working on my master's in social work. Thank you. And. Um, I continue to study um, grief issues, uh, particularly because of the death of my husband about three years ago. And um, my husband chose um, Oregon's right to die, which has been in existence now for about 25 years. And um, I know you, you used the term earlier about euthanasia, which is a term that um, I don't identify with as it relates to um, right to die and death with dignity, but um, 
I'm curious, he worked, we worked with a lot of people during his dying process, um, including a deaf midwife and uh, we had home health care. Uh, we never did work with hospice uh, because we had all these other helping professionals to assist us in, in the whole process. But just kind of curious, because we did study hospice a bit at the end of his life to try to decide, you know, what path, but he knew before he was ever uh, diagnosed with metastatic melanoma um, that that was the choice he wanted if he thought that he could no longer be contributing to the good of humanity um, with his life. And when the tumors went to his brain, he just felt really clear that that was a decision he wanted to make. I, and I don't really know what my question is, Ken. It's just that I'm still working on um, the issue that people, you talked about your mother and what it was like for her to be this sort of avant-garde person out front with all these um, talking about death and dying issues. And it's something I do a lot um, myself and uh, sort of coming to grips with people's lack of acceptance with uh, death with dignity and organs right to die is, is an issue I deal with. So anything you have to say on that topic? Um, well, I think as Elizabeth was paralyzed towards the end of her life, she kind of softened her stance on that. Um, so, you know, I think if you were to ask her now, 20 years later, 15 years later, uh, she might have a different answer. Um, but she really felt that, you know, everyone has a mission and, and there's a great video. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Can I share a video, Susan? Do we have a moment? Please do. Yep. Okay. Let's see if something works today. Um, my mother is speaking to a patient who's completely paralyzed, can't say anything. And you see my mother's capacity to find like hope and love and, and, and something beautiful in everything she does. And let me see if it shows up. Uh, and this would be a great example of dealing with this situation and here it is and let's see and share my screen in the beginning is the same the video I showed before but then there's about two or three minutes where she's talking to this dying woman and I think it really addresses the question you're asking can you see that Susan yes we can okay when I started this work, I was very much hated for sitting with dying patients and making the hospital famous for dying patients. And a decade later, I received so many. The most frustrating thing for you right now is that you can't speak well. Mm. 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 Bringing the patient home to a familiar and loving environment provides more uh, trying to get rid of the Spanish <laughs> bringing the patient home to a familiar and loving environment provides more opportunity to counsel not only the patient but also the family dr. Kubler Ross believes that giving the final days of a loved one to their family significantly helps relatives cope with their grief she knows that she's um, going to die, but the process is taking a long time. And what is it that she's supposed to be learning through it's such a long process? If you can regard this as a challenge and not as a threat or a punishment or something negative, it is a real challenge. Like you're very good to communicate with her mm -hmm. all the time. You can learn to communicate like this with your husband, and with your children, and with me. Mm -hmm. And that's not so difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as we don't fake it, that we mm -hmm. understand you when we really don't, that is also a lesson for us. And then they have to learn to read your needs and your wants. And then it's their gift to find out what it is that you want. The one thing Mother wanted to ask you, and the thing that bothers her, is that she feels that she's, since she's unable to use her body, what purpose is she serving? And she feels like 
for anybody to live, they should have some purpose in life, and she can't see what her purpose is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think it's more important to run around the house using the broom and cleaning windows? Mm -hmm. Mm. Or is there also a purpose in learning how to receive? Mm. And letting go? Oh, yeah. You got her there. <laughs> and mm. letting your children mother you a little bit after mm -hmm. you have mothered them for so many years. Don't you think that teaches them something? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. She feels like she's a burden, and when she gets down, she starts talking about maybe she should go into a home, and we have to really talk that out. Every day you can give your children to take care of you, and to see your courage and your love is a gift to them. And you cheat them out of all these experiences if you're afraid to receive. Does that address your question to some degree? Thank you, Ken. I, I think I would love to have more follow up with you on this. Yeah, Thank you. please. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Alan, did you want to ask your question? I saw that you had unmuted earlier. You should be able to unmute now. There you go. Please go ahead. Thanks, Sydney and Ken, um, for putting it together. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, I, I suppose my question was in relation to the stages. I know recently David Kessler added a sixth stage with right. the permission right. of the foundation and stuff like that in terms of finding meaning after loss. But I suppose I'd really like to talk about just that video you shared. And I'm, I'm grateful that you did share the last segment there in terms of Elizabeth, she did a lovely way of being, you know, and, you know, she talked about the nonverbal communication. Um, but I think she's such a lovely, comforting tone in her voice when she was speaking there. And um, I was really struck by that. And in terms of um, her eye contact as well with the dying patient. But just in terms of um, COVID-19, and you talk about the quadrants and the four quadrants and the importance of physical touch, in early development, but then in later stage in that survival aspect and how I suppose much that will be in, impacted um, as a result of COVID-19 and the safety measures and restrictions in terms of nursing homes and, and all that goes with it, you know. Um, I think the impact of that will be great and in terms of, um, just in terms of, of the work in the aftermath of COVID-19, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it makes it much tougher when you can't be there in person to deal with the love and emotion and so forth. It, 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 that doesn't come across on Zoom, of course. So, I mean, there's only so much you can do in a situation like that in a pandemic. Uh, yeah. I think Elizabeth said COVID is somewhat like AIDS because there's so much stigma attached and so much misinformation and anger and hatred. She said, you know, we've got to learn from these things to make society better. And unfortunately, you know, part of society just becomes worse, and some do grow from it, but some go the opposite direction. Mm. Thank you. Uh, but yes, we, we did give David permission, I don't know permission's the right word, but he wanted to do a book on the six stages of grief, um, and Claire Bidwell-Smith did a book on the anxieties, the six stage of grief, and somebody else did a book as Hope as a Six Stage, and I've mm. seen books on the seven stages, eight stages, nine stages, <laughs> take your pick. Mm. So it really doesn't matter. It's just all part of the conversation. And if, you know, you, if that resounds with you, if that makes you feel better, if you, that touches something in you, that, that's great. You know, she just wanted to be a part of the conversation and it opened it up at a time when there was no conversation about grief and death and dying. Yeah, I know your mother's work greatly influenced um, an article I published on suicide. You know, and I'm forever grateful uh, for our work and the learning I received from that and um, from our work, you know, great admiration, you know. And um, thank you. So it's a privilege to be here and attending. And um, so thank you. My mom had a house in Ireland. It was great. In Newry, do you yeah. know where Newry is? 
I do, yeah. Well, it's yeah. kind of more no Northern Ireland, yeah. It's yeah, still it was right on the border, and she used to go there a lot, and she used to bring us there, and it was really <laughs> a wonderful experience. Very good. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge, I was looking back through the, the chat, people that have come from all over the world where it's the middle of the night and they're up listening to this talk. I just so appreciate your interest in uh, making yourself available for this. And I just want to also say, we just have a couple of minutes. Actually, we're just a couple of minutes over. Just one last opportunity. If you're sitting there thinking, I could never ask this question, please do. Um, Probably not a lot of opportunities to ask a question about somebody who was raised by one of our local or legends here in hospice and end of life care. And I see some of my friends out there, so I just want to acknowledge them. Oh, yeah. My friends Lourdes, yes. Yvonne, who I talked to yesterday. Hello, <laughs> Thanks for joining me again. Yes. And we have EKR Japan on the line. Yes. Well, we have a we very. Have, um, Lucy Bidwell. We mentioned her book. Hi, Lucy. Oh, great, because she's on my list of people to try and ask to do an event for us. So well, there perfect. she is. <laughs> um, I see your sister's name up here too, Ken. Um, I think, yeah, I just thank you all. And Ken, it looks like there are, there are no more questions. And so I just want to thank you so much for your time, um, for the amazing stories. I, it's so my friend Andrea Levine and I were talking about this recently, like the people like Ram Dass, right around the time he died, like how many people, how few people from that original hospice movement and time are still on the planet. And to have you be able to speak about your mother's work with such clarity. And also, I think it's really amazing sometimes when you're in the middle of it, though, I believe Elizabeth pretty had a fairly good idea what was going on and what she was affecting. But I think watching the work from the perspective of 50 or 51 years later to see the impact that it's had around the world is just really so beautiful and that you um, spend so much of your life, um, though this is not, you know, this end of life stuff was not really your work, but your mother's work, now it's your work, that you have done such a beautiful job um, continuing to hold up um, all that was of value to Elizabeth. And to all of you that are joining us from hospices across the country or across the world, um, thank you so much for your willingness to turn towards suffering, whether you're a hospice volunteer or you work in an office or you are the CEO or you are doing any other work in any other place along that line. For those here that whose work is in bereavement and loss and grief, I just so appreciate the willingness of people to turn towards suffering um, instead of away from it. And I think there's no quality that's more needed in the world right now than that quality. So thank you so much. And uh, we will be sending you shortly after this, um, or maybe longly, a couple of hours after this, I'm going to send you an evaluation. I really, this really helps us in trying to understand what's helpful and how these programs land for people. I will send some resources, including Ken's contact information and, um, some other of our upcoming workshops that I think will be really of value. For those of you working at end of life care, I cannot recommend highly enough. Next Thursday's talk by Dr. David Feldman. His work is called, the talk is called Redefining Hope at End of Life. And for anybody that's ever heard somebody say, well, we can't tell mom or I can't tell my patient or I can't tell somebody what the real prognosis is because it will take away their hope. He has done a lot of study and research about this and it turns out that's just not actually accurate. So there is a cost of, involved. We try never to do that, but for this one, we, um, we have to. Um, I hope that people will come and hear him. He's uh, really one of the, He's an amazing speaker and it's an amazing topic because it's so like Elizabeth's work is so often misunderstood. And uh, this idea of what hope is at end of life could be a real eye opener for many people. So um, thank you so much. Alan has put another post up here. We will be in touch with you and uh, you'll continue to receive updates from Mission Hospice from our education program. So thank you all. Thank you for staying a few minutes late and um, hope to see you again in the not too distant future. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Thank you all. I'll have a chance to say goodbye to Ken.